In this section we're going to talk about software controlled microscopes. So as you're well aware these microscopes these days are fully motorized, they have digital cameras, they have shutters. You really want to operate all of those components uh, together, open the shutter, take a picture, close the shutter, etc. And you really need computer control of all the different components. So you need software to run these things. There are a bunch of different software packages out there. One of them is called Micromanager. Um, that one is freely available and runs a whole lot of uh, microscope hardware. I'll use that to present software control of microscopes to you. However, all the principles of what's going on here is directly applicable to other software packages as well. So first of all, we need to load a configuration file. And this is a file that tells the software what hardware is connected to the system. And so I've set that up in advance. And in this case, we have a Zeiss microscope and an old Princeton Instruments camera. And that's about it. And that's all being uh, told here in this configuration file. So I'll load it. Here is the control of the microscope equipment, mainly of the camera. We can set an exposure time and we can snap an image. And so when we snap an image, the software will automatically open the shutter and close it again. And so that is set with this auto shutter checkbox. If I were to uncheck that and then snap an image, we would get nothing, noise. So since there's no elimination of the sample, but when I open the shutter and then snap an image, it's also fine, but now we're continuously illuminating the sample. So that's not good because we bleach it. So uh, this auto shutter makes sure that your illumination is tightly synchronized with the camera. So I can set an exposure time that is twice as long and then snap an image. And what you notice is that this image actually looks very, very similar. It didn't get twice as bright. And that is because here in this part, we have set the auto stretch checkbox. And this part of the screen shows you a, shows two different graphs all together in one and it's very useful to have them both together. So one is a histogram that has the grayscale values that the camera can produce on the x-axis and then a number of pixels at each of those bins of grayscale values on the y-axis. So from this we can see that the histogram is mainly has relatively low uh, pixel values. So we're very far from saturation of the camera. So seeing directly what your pixel values are is very important because in principle, you would like to use the full dynamic range that is available on your sensor. So you would want to spread out this histogram as much as possible over the full dynamic range of the sensor. So this shows something else, and that is that the camera can produce 4096 different grayscale values, but our poor monitor is not capable of showing all of those. It only has 256 grayscale values. Even worse, our eyes can not really discriminate more than about 100 or so different grayscale values unless we accommodate uh, uh, change the size of our pupils. So to map the intensities that are available on the camera on the display, we need to have some kind of function. And that function is shown in this same graph. So that is the line going from the dark triangle here to the bright triangle. So were I to move this line to the left, then my image here gets a lot brighter because we make pixel values that are lower and lower, whiter and whiter. Were I to bring this left slider here 
the dark slider to the right, then you see that we get more and more black in the image. Now, a, a very useful way to set this up is use the auto um, button or to check the auto stretch checkbox so that automatically every time the scaling will be applied based on the minimum and maximum pixel values. So you always want to look at this histogram to see what is going on. So for instance, if we now double the exposure time again, so we now go to 300 milliseconds, snap an image, then we see that our histogram moved out to the right. So also our auto scaling moved further to the right. And so in general, the more of your dynamic range, the more of your histogram you're using, the more information you have in the images that you acquire. A couple of other important things. We want to have a live image. So when I press live, we get now a live feed from the camera and that's for instance useful when you're focusing so I'm now moving the focus dial on the microscope and so this way I can focus exactly where I want binning so we talked in the camera lecture about the ability to group groups of four pixels and read those out in one go so I can control that here I can say oh, Okay, give me two by two binning, so four pixels in one. And when I now snap an image, it is significantly smaller, but you also see in the histogram that it got significantly brighter. Then also what F often happens is that we're not interested in the whole image, but only in a small region of it. So let's say this is what we really want to follow. I can use the ROI tool. We only get this small region. So the camera can also read this out much faster. And um, so it's al always helpful to use an ROI whenever it's applicable. Now to go back to the full frame, we use the button next to that ROI and snap an image. All these controls mainly concern the camera it's very essential but there are also other parts of the microscope and um, in this software the other parts of the microscope can be configured through these presets and for instance I made a preset here for GFP and what that does is that that preset moves the dichroic reflector in place that gives me uh, the GFP fluorescence so likewise, I can move it to Psi 3. It moves the reflector in the microscope. I snap an image and I now have a image of uh, mitochondria in this case. You will often want to set up experiments where you take these two different channels and do things as time lapses or take Z stacks. That is all hidden under this multi D acquisition button. So when I press that, we get a new window. And in this window, we can set up time points, we can set up multiple XY positions, we can set up Z stacks, and we can set up channels. Now these channels, we get from that same group that we just used, the Psi 3, that has Psi 3 and GFP in it. So uh, I'll set the exposure time for this particular channel. Probably something like 400 is good enough. So in this case, we're only using channels. We're taking one image with the Psi 3 dichroic and one image with the GFP dichroic. And when I now say acquire, it first takes the red image and then the green image and overlays it for me. And I'll now take Z stacks relative to the current position and we'll do something like we're going from minus three 
from where we are to plus three microns and we'll take steps of half a micron. And then when we acquire now, in this case it has, the system has been set up to take the Z-Stack in one channel first and it's taking all of those and then we'll move back, switch to the other channel and take uh, all images in the second channel. So the focus motor of the microscope makes a half a micron step in between each image. And in the end we then have a 3D stack of images. And since this sample is very flat, we basically uh, go through focus here.